pictures because I have promised the dogs that they could uh, play with these $10,000 retrieving toys at the end of the, of the talk. Um, let me introduce my uh, co-speakers over here. Um, they are both standard poodles. They were graciously provided for me by David, who uh, works in the music industry, which explains their names. This is Marley, and this is Tosh. So uh, uh, they're quite musical dogs. I was really quite puzzled by uh, the invitation uh, because you know I knew that TED did not stand for technology. Um, uh, entertainment and dogs, uh, and uh, but I have come to uh, think about it, and actually, in reality, what you are looking at over here is technology. Um, we have been designing and redesigning dogs. These guys are inventions; they are designer animals um, for fourteen thousand years. You know, 14,000 years ago, dogs began to hang out around the uh, villages and encampments of human beings. Why? Because we were slobs. And we would take whatever garbage and we'd throw it out to the periphery of the camp. And you know, the grandfathers of our dogs, you know, <laughs> they're, they're lazy like we are, right? And why should we go hunt for something when there's all this food laying around over there? And then, whenever a stranger or an animal would come around, they would set up a commotion. Now, you know, this provided for human beings two really nice benefits. First of all, the dog got rid of the garbage, so that made life more pleasant, fewer insects, and that sort of thing. Second of all, if they would set up a commotion, they would warn you if something bad was gonna happen in the village. So human beings said, okay, we're gonna keep these things, but we're gonna redesign them. Because if they're gonna be really good warning devices, they need a voice. And in fact, we began systematically designing and re-engineering dogs, breeding them for a voice. Because to be a good guard animal for your village, or a good burglar alarm for your house, they had to have a loud and a persistent bark. Since that time, we have redesigned dogs many times. We designed these guys to fit our technology. You know, before we had firearms or that sort of thing, we had hounds. The purpose of a hound was to go ahead and run down the game and to kill it. And all we needed to do was to run fast enough to get there before they ate it all and we had food on the table. Now afterwards, we developed, you know, firearms, muzzle-loading firearms. Now, you know, they're really slow. You know, you have to take the powder horn and you take the damn thing like this and you put the ball in. I mean, you get one shot, what, every 30 seconds, minute, and then what, 25 yards? So we designed a dog called a pointer, and a pointer moves totally quietly, and it finds the game and it freezes with its head pointing toward the game so that you can sneak up close enough so that you can get that one shot at the bird, and in fact, uh, maybe come home with something. And oh yes, by the way, if you knock down the bird, man being incredibly lazy required the dog to go out and fetch it. When the technology got a little bit better and we had uh, uh, cartridge loading weapons, yes, Tosh Tosh, uh, we could hunt behind setters. Setters move much more quickly. And you hunt behind a pair of setters. The beat of the setter's tail tells you how close they think they are to the bird and then they freeze on point toward the game, and you use two setters so that you can align down the head of this one and down the head of that one, and wherever those two lines of sights intersect, that's the bush which they think the bird is behind. And then the technology got better. We began to get uh, multiple barrel shotguns and uh, very fast breech-loading weapons over there, and so we created spaniels. Spaniels are totally into undisciplined hunters. They run out over there, they quarter anything in front of you, over there and flush things without any warning and you needed that technology in order to hunt behind them. And then the farms and the urban settings began to encroach on all the good uh, dry hunting land so you had to go out and hunt in scrap land like marshes and that sort of thing. This meant that the hunters had to build blinds 
uh, and sit over it. It's sort of dumb, I always thought, you know, you're sitting over there for hours waiting for the stupid duck to fly by over there. But you needed a dog then which was going to be totally silent, totally attentive to you, to go out and fetch the game, and that was the creation of the retriever. These guys are retrievers. Don't anybody ever forget that. The poodle is a retriever. Um, in uh, French, they're called caniche, after canard, which is a duck, and these were meant to be still water retrievers. Um, later on, you know, we even developed, we have a nice Canadian development in over here. You know, the more realistic the, uh, the uh, it, you had to put sort of lures or decoys out over there to, to bring in the ducks. And the more realistic they looked, or the more activity that there was there, uh, the more likely it is the ducks would come over to investigate. So we developed something which is called the Nova Scotia Duck Tulling Retriever. Only in Canada, you say, right? Um, and this is a little red dog, and its job is either to swim up and back and around the lures to make them bob up and down to look more realistic so the ducks come by, or to act like a crazy maniac and run back and forth on the land so that it serves as a lure and the ducks come over to say, hey, that looks pretty stupid, and they're close enough for you to knock them down. By the way, in Nova Scotia, they do not call them Nova Scotia duck culling retrievers. They call them little river dogs. In addition to that, we have been systematically breeding dogs to be companions. And this is really important. You know, people say dogs like, like a little Pekingese or a little Maltese, that's a frou-frou dog. Uh-uh. That's a dog with a skill which we have wired in. They are supposed to be sucky-faced companions. That's their job. <laughs> and it's not new. It's not, you know, our current, feet modern uh, civilization. We can find pictures of little dogs which are clearly going to evolve into the Maltese on Greek urns 2,500 years ago, on tiny little strings with people walking around with them clearly with no other reason than to say, that's a package of love. And in fact, that's why we have this empathy with dogs. And that empathy that we have is because we have created these to be the perfect animal. You know, the Plain Sioux have a, uh, a legend and it goes that the great spirit decided that he wanted to separate the world of the animals from the world of man. So he gathered all of the animals and all of the men on a great plain. And he drew a great line in the plain. And that line on one side were all of the animals and on the other side was man. And that line began to sink into the earth and it began to open up until a great chasm began to form. And at the last moment, before that chasm became unbreachable, dog leapt over and stood by man. Now that's very much, that's a sentiment from a hard group of people who lived a hard life and still felt that same empathy. Why? Because even under those conditions, people were breeding into their dogs, not just the function, but the companionship. Now the thing which I find incredibly remarkable is we live in North America and one out of every four families lives with a dog. And we teach our kids nothing about dogs. You know, they go to school and they get projects on the snowy owl, on tree frogs, on killer whales over there, but they're told nothing about this, this wonderful predator, this, this technologically designed, genetically engineered beast that they're apt to live with. And they have all sorts of misperceptions about it. I mean, it drives me absolutely crazy. You, know, you ask people, well, you know, can dogs communicate? Oh, yeah, they bark. Oh, all right. Well, I mean, that's dumb, right? Dog's a predator. He's a pack hunter. He's going to coordinate the hunt by going roof, roof. I mean, that deer is going to hear it, and he's going to lose lunch. So, in fact, he's going to use an awful lot of body language. So you point that out to people and say, oh, yeah, I know. They wag their tails when they're happy. Well, you know, it doesn't work that way. I mean, if the dog's tail is up in the air and it's wagging like that, that's not a happy tail wag. That's the wag of a dominant dog saying, back off, I'm boss around here, give me space. It drives me crazy. Moms are saying, oh yes, look at the little happy dog, go over and pet him, honey, right? If their tail is low between their legs and wagging back slowly, the dog is being either anxious or feeling poorly. 
The closest thing which you can come to a happy tail wag is that big, broad tail wag which drags their hips with them, and even that is not happiness. That's, I call that the fearless leader um, tail wag. It basically is the dog being very submissive, saying, oh yes, you are my fearless leader, and you will take care of me, and you will feed me, and you will not hurt me. Now people say, well, that's just emotion. That's not communication. No, that's not true. Because you see, if I go ahead and give to my dog a bowl of food, and he's hungry, he'll give me that fearless leader tail wag, right? But if he walks into a room and he finds that same bowl of food, the same hungry dog, and there's nothing in that room except a TV camera, uh-uh. He's going to eat the food, but no tail wag. Why? Well, for the same reason that you don't talk to walls. <laughs> he will wag his tail to something which he thinks is alive. So it'll be you, the cat, a butterfly, maybe a piece of lint which goes across the floor, which might be alive, OK? But to inanimate objects, no way. Now, dogs have language, and I want you to understand that. The language of the dog is equivalent to the language of a two-year-old child, and for the super dogs, it's someplace about a two-and-a-half-year-old. And anybody who tells you, no, 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 only human beings have language, this is the arrogance of Noam Chomsky, okay? Um, in fact, they're crazy. You know, dogs have language in every sense of the word. My dogs, who are trained, have a language which can, can consists of about 160 words. And uh, they have signals. And they have signs. And they have grammar. All dogs have grammar. You remember what grammar is all about, right? Things like word sequence makes a difference. So a man-eating shark is something different than a shark-eating man, OK? And dogs have grammar, just the same way that we do. For example, take a simple uh, breath growl, which is har. okay? Now that har basically is a dominant dog saying, back off, or I've got teeth, okay? Then you take a rising bark, which is ruff, like that, and that's sort of, hey, look at that, okay? Now we put these together, okay? Har, ruff. That's an invitation to play. And the dog will usually put its elbows down on the ground, its tail up in the air, charge off in some random direction um, in order to indicate that he wants to play. How about roof har? That is a signal by a very frightened dog who's basically saying, you're scaring me, and I feel like running, but you're scaring me, and I want this, and I may just defend it. OK? So they've got grammar. Now, they use their language, and they read our body language, and they use a huge amount of their own body language. The great wonder to me is that they don't eat all of our children. You want to know why? <laughs> Everything which a child does if, when he sees a dog is wrong, OK? He sees a dog. What is the first thing he does? He stares at it. That's a threat. Next, what does he do? He opens his mouth in a big smile and he shows his teeth. That's a threat. He runs straight at the dog. That's a threat. He raises his arms up in the air as if he's uh, making himself taller. That's a threat. And then he opens his fingers forward to reach for the dog. I want you to look at that, okay? Look at your hand like that, turn it around, and that's teeth, okay? And a very impressive amount of teeth. Why don't they eat us, our kids? Again, genetic engineering. We have engineered them not to eat our children. <laughs> now, I love these beasts. I mean, I talk to them all the time, and everybody talks to their dogs. And in fact, we find that there are all sorts of different ways which we talk to, to our dogs. It's like, like the way that um, mothers talk to their kids. They have this separate little sing-song thing, like you want to little drinky there, honey, and that sort of thing, right? Well, we've got something which I can call doggerel, okay? And we do the same thing for dogs, okay? We put these little diminutives on it. You want to go for a walkie? Wanna, walkie, you know, that sort of thing. We repeat things a lot, you know. Uh, you want to drink? You want to drink, don't you, honey? Right, okay, and that sort of thing, and we repeat them. And then we have this set of, of ways in which we interact with them directly. One of them is where we sort of just talk to the dog and, uh, we um, act as though 
uh, they are answering the question, you know, and you, we sort of, so you get these kinds of conversations. It sounds like one side of a telephone conversation. What am I going to get Aunt Sylvia for her birthday to this week? Oh, that's a good idea, Lassie. That's uh, chocolate. She likes chocolates, doesn't she? She does. You know, we got her chocolates last time. Yeah, good suggestion. We have chocolate. But sometimes I believe we go beyond that. We fill in the words. I mean, you know, John Steinbeck, in his book, Travels with Charlie's, writes these whole sets of conversations where he's talking to Charlie, his standard poodle, and he's supplying the answers. You know, he says, you're feeling a little bit poorly today, aren't you, Charlie? Well, would I be looking here like this at you if I wasn't feeling poorly? And so on and so forth. The other thing about it is talking with our dogs does wonderful things. We can show that an individual who talks with a dog, who touches a dog, in fact, their heartbeat starts to slow. Their breathing becomes more regular. Their muscle tension begins to be relieved. In other words, they show all the signs of de-stressing. In fact, we can show that people who own dogs are much less likely to uh, suffer, suffer from symptoms of depression. And when they're elderly, they're much less likely to uh, use medical services or need a lot of medical services. In fact, there's a wonderful study which was conducted out of the University of Pennsylvania, which um, they looked at men who had had their first heart attack and did a five-year follow-up. And they found out that at the end of five years, those who owned dogs had a higher survival rate. Why? The de-stressing thing. By the way, a recent study just came out which showed that, in fact, dog owners are much like, less likely to get divorced. Why? You come home, you need some TLC, right? You've had this absolutely rotten day. You open up the door, and there your spouse is, right? And they're sitting on the sofa, and they're fuming. They've had a worse day than you. Now, if you said, come on, honey, I need some love, okay, right? What happens, right? Pfft, head gets snapped off, fight. But there's Lassie, right? Oh, love me, love me, love me, right? Okay, you pet them, de-stress, down all this stuff comes over there. You feel better, you feel relaxed, no fight. Okay, and you've just extended your marriage by another three or four months. Boom, just like that. <laughs> now, I want you to understand, I am not saying that you're going to be able to discuss ancient Chinese philosophy with your dogs, okay? I mean, you can have the kind of conversation which you would have with, or which I have with my two-year-old grandchildren. You know, they talk about the things which they want and the things that they need. Dogs also talk about social status, okay? So where, who's moving up in the pack and who's moving down in the pack? But other than that, they don't talk about a whole lot. However, ever since I've been doing this kind of research, people have been coming to me with stories about the way in which their dog communicates to them. Most of them are interesting. Some of them sound a little bit, you know, fringy to me. For example, a colleague of mine said, came to me and said, Oh, well, he says, I thought I would tell you this story. He says, we were, we were out, um, you know, I was out over there with Jamie, my kid, and we were going to the latest revival of 101 Dalmatians. Anyway, we're sitting over there, and we hear this sound off to the side. It's like, <laughs> and I can't figure out what the sound is. So I get up, and I look, and here's this guy, and he's sitting over there, and next to him is this collie, and this collie is laughing. He's like, <laughs> And he's laughing so hard, he finally rolls off the seat, and he's rolling on the floor. <laughs> so I walked up to him, and I said, excuse me, is that your collie laughing? And he said, yeah. And he says, don't you think that's a little strange? And he said, you bet you. She hated the book. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Ask him how many people have dogs. For my own edification, if I can, okay, just a quick, how many of you people here have dogs? Good. Live long and prosper. <laughs>